we'll start today with a quiz. See, every, uh, every class I forget something, and I depend on you guys to um, let me know when I do that. Uh, last time I uh, mentioned something about the Wall Street Journal, and they had covered a uh, breaking news that North Carolina had passed a law that prohibited public school students from tormenting teachers by doing something online. And I failed to, uh, to tell you what the Wall Street Journal had said about that. Yes. Yes. They were bullying teachers, yeah. And, and the Wall Street Journal reported this news. And here's what the Wall Street Journal said. And the quiz is, is this accurate? Traditional issues of free speech on public school grounds are largely settled, thanks to a 1969 Supreme Court ruling in Tinker versus Des Moines. That ruling held that students' First Amendment rights are generally protected on campus, but that administrators can punish them for speech on school grounds when they can clearly show it caused significant disruption to school activities or violated others' rights. All right? No? What's wrong with it? Yeah, um, I mean, Tinker hardly settled, as the Wall Street Journal says, the rights of public school students. It did say that students have First Amendment rights, which is nice, uh, and it said that school officials can limit those rights if the exercise of the rights would disrupt, would be disruptive of something in the school. But then what did they do? Then there were the intervening cases, the Fraser, the speech case, the, the political speech case, and the school newspaper case, and the Bonkitz case, none of which involved disruption. That's not the law. And I would hardly call the rights of public uh, school students a settled issue, uh, given how um, iffy and uncertain and maybe incomprehensible the court decisions have been in this area. I mean, we do know that public school students do not have full First Amendment rights, but that's about all we know. Jason? Yeah, well, in the public school area, the court has not overruled any of its precedents. So Tinker's still the law, but it only covers armbands, apparently. And Bungets is still the law, but it only covers advocacy of illegal drug use. It's so uh, useless as a matter of principle that um, the only principle we understand is that public school students don't have full First Amendment rights. Now let's look at a different kind of category of speakers uh, that may or may not have full First Amendment rights, and that's corporations. And the famous or infamous case of uh, Citizens United, which is the most important First Amendment decision of the 21st century, uh, and certainly the most controversial, and certainly the most misunderstood or mischaracterized. Uh, that's partly because the opinions in the case run to 176 pages. I have spared you that. I've given you a summary of Citizens United. Um, not very many people, I suppose, have plowed through and attempted to understand all 176 pages. And for that reason, a lot of people who are upset about the decision frequently mistake what it actually decided uh, and, what, and even what its consequences have been. The case decided five to four along traditional conservative liberal five, four, Line, political lines, that part of the McCain-Feingold campaign finance law was unconstitutional. That part prohibited corporations and unions from using their own funds to spending their own money to support or oppose political candidates. Um, the values, the constitutional values involved in the case are unrestricted political speech, a strong value on one side, and keeping corporate money from contaminating elections uh, on the other side. The uh, five to four decision came down on the free speech side or the corporate side, depending on how you look at it. If all you care about in life is the First Amendment, Citizens United is a wonderful decision. But there are, after all, other values. Um, the case was decided by the Roberts Court, of course. This was 2010. So here's the way they looked, the court that decided that case. What's different now? No, Kagan. Kagan was not yet on the court. Stevens was. She replaced John Paul Stevens, the second from the left. Um, Kagan actually argued Citizens United in the second argument uh, in the Supreme Court for the government. Um, the reaction to the decision was instant and vehement, um, but the liberal establishment, and I suppose I count myself among them, uh, were apoplectic. The uh, New York Times wrote a hysterical editorial the next day. Uh, there were several instant calls for a constitutional amendment. The Berkeley City Council went to work on a resolution uh, condemning the decision. Uh, the local movie theaters condemned the decision. Impeach! Impeach the Supreme Court 5. It's a disgrace. Corporations aren't people. Um, people for the American way said that the court, the majority, had staged a hostile takeover of American democracy on behalf of corporations. Uh, there was this doctored image around the internet showing the five with the robes festooned with corporate logos, uh, the captives of uh, corporate America. Uh, and the critics of the decision complained um, both about how the court reached its decision, which we'll go into in a minute, and the court's supposed reliance on two fictions. One, that money is speech and two, that corporations are persons with free speech rights. And now, of course, um, people complain that uh, the decision unleashed super PACs to flood uh, elections with corporate money. So what I'd like to do is discuss first the case, what it was about, uh, then the opinions in the case, 
do some analysis of it, and then consider its aftermath, what we're living with as a result of the Citizens United decision. Citizens United is a nonprofit political, conservative political um, corporation. It's a nonprofit, but it's in corporate form. Uh, and they produced a feature length documentary attacking Hillary Clinton. They did this during the 2008 uh, primary season, presidential primary season, where uh, Senator, then Senator Clinton was running against Ob then Senator Obama uh, for the Democratic presidential nomination. And Citizens United was opposed to Clinton, and they did this hour and a half uh, feature length film, uh, which was basically an infomercial uh, condemning Clinton for um, her sins, according to Citizens United. And they wanted to put the, um, the film on video on demand, but the provisions of the uh, campaign of finance law, the McCain Feingold law, made it illegal for a corporation to spend money on um, el electioneering communications within 30 days of an election, or 60 days, I think it is, of a, of a primary, whatever it was. It was a window in which corporations could not take out television ads supporting or opposing political uh, campaigns. Uh, and Citizens United sued the agency of the federal government that polices elections, the Federal Election Commission, claiming that the law didn't apply, did not apply to a feature-length film as opposed to a television spot, uh, that it didn't apply at all to video on demand as opposed to a television ad, and that it didn't apply to it as a nonprofit corporation that is funded almost completely by individuals. Um, and when it sued the FEC, uh, it stipulated, that is formally agreed in court, in the trial court, that it was not challenging the law on its face, only as it applied. If it was challenged on its face, it would be saying that law can't be applied to anybody. It's unconstitutional in all its applications. So we're not doing that. We're just challenging it as applied to us and our film. Um, and it did not, in its lawsuit against the FCC, challenge, question, uh, any of the court's precedents. The court, 20 years before, in 1990, had decided a case called Austin, which involved a state law, which was very similar to the federal McCain-Feingold law, and the court had upheld it 20 years before. So then Jeffrey Tubin has a masterful discussion in his New Yorker article in the, uh, in the Reader of how the court got to the point of deciding the case. The decision in January of 2010 was um, an exercise in judicial activism, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, the court decided that the law was unconstitutional on its face in all of its applications, uh, which was relief that was not even asked for by Citizens United. The court overruled the Austin case and part of another more recent precedent uh, that had not been argued by any party. Uh, the decision in doing this violated all of the principles of judicial restraint that Chief Justice Roberts had espoused in his uh, confirmation hearings when he was appointed to be Chief Justice. Um, that is, that decisions ought to be based on the narrowest possible grounds. Don't paint with a broad brush. Just decide what actually has to be decided. Um, that will promote unanimity in the court, where here we have a five to four split. Uh, and it also seemingly was inconsistent with um, Robert's respect for stare decisis, the common law method principle that requires courts to follow the precedents decided before. Here they overruled at least one and a half precedents. Uh, that uh, must have, I mean, Roberts must have been conscious, <laughs> clearly was, uh, that what the court had done, was doing in Citizens United, was inconsistent with the principles of judicial restraint that he so fervently defended, provoking him to write a separate opinion, a concurring opinion in Citizens United, uh, in which he said that it's more important that we get it right than that we decide something narrowly. It's more important that we get it right now than that we respect precedent from before. Um, and he said if stare decisis were some kind of absolute principle, racial segregation in the schools, for example, would still be constitutional because Brown versus Board of Education overruled the precedent from the 19th century in Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, the decision in the um, citizens of the opinion for the court, the majority opinion for the court in Citizens United was assigned by Roberts He's in the majority. He's Chief Justice. One of the powers of the Chief Justice is the power to say who's going to write the opinion if the chief is in the majority. Uh, and he assigned the opinion to uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy. And the four conservatives joined in the opinion. Kennedy brushed aside these narrower grounds that could have been used to decide the case, you know, that it didn't apply to Citizens United and so on, and said that a notion of judicial responsibility required the court to condemn the law on its face uh, to avoid the chilling effect created by the law on political speech. Uh, the chilling effect was caused by the uncertainty of whether the law would apply to various kinds of political uh, communications and to whom it might apply. Kennedy noted that the statute was very broad. It included all corporations, 5.8 million of them, uh, many of which are mom and pop operations, little businesses, automobile repair shops, for example, um, or single shareholder corporations. And it includes all the nonprofits, like Citizens United, like the Sierra Club, like the National Rifle Association, and so on, nonprofits. And it includes all labor unions, large and small. Plus, the law was not a crystal clear example of legislating. It, the law was a little roundabout, difficult to understand, not very forthright. And uh, the Federal Election Commission had attempted to interpret the law so many times that um, what you, you're facing, if you're about to invest in a political commercial, is 568 pages of regulations put out by the FEC, 1,278 pages of explanations issued by the FEC, uh, and 1,771 advisory opinions given by the FEC, so that only 
the most expert of expert of political consultants could have any notion uh, what uh, this law actually meant. And the chilling effect was enhanced, as it always is, by the fact that this law carried criminal penalties. If you get it wrong, you do some electioneering communication, and the FCC says that's illegal, that's a criminal offense. Um, Kennedy pointed out that uh, these examples of, of felonies where the Sierra Club wants to take a position against uh, an anti-environmental candidate, uh, they couldn't do it. The NRA couldn't put out a book that supported uh, or proposed a candidate uh, who favored handgun control. Uh, or the ACLU uh, couldn't uh, support a candidate who believed in free speech. Uh, those would all be felonies under this law. Well, what about the merits? What was the court's analysis uh, on the merits of the case? Um, clearly, the law restricted political speech. It restricted the content of political speech. That is, what it applied to is basically commercials that support or oppose a candidate for federal office. In other words, it operated on the content of the speech. That triggers, this will, if it isn't familiar to you now, it certainly will be, that triggers strict scrutiny. The court must exercise strict scrutiny of such a law, a law that restricts speech based on its content. And strict scrutiny means that the burden is on the government to demonstrate that the restriction on speech serves a compelling, not substantial, not important, not significant, a compelling government interest. And that the law is narrowly tailored to serve that interest. That's what strict scrutiny amounts to. So what are the interests that the government used to argue in support of the campaign finance law? They were basically three, that we need this restriction on corporate spending uh, in particular, uh, because if corporations are, you know, mega corporations are allowed to influence elections, the whole electoral process will be distorted by the wealth that the corporations are able to throw their weight behind one candidate or another. The idea is we should level the playing field, not allow the corporations to swamp the playing field with their money. Um, that's one rationale. Um, and Justice Kennedy took on the anti-distortion rationale. That was the rationale used in the Austin case 20 years before on the previous law. Uh, and Kennedy said, well, if we adopted that justification for the law, that would allow the government to ban all corporate speech about elections. Even books the corporations might put out could be banned under that rationale. Um, and look, the law applies to nonprofits and small, even single shareholder corporations. They don't have the money to dominate elections. The law is overbroad in that respect. Um, and uh, if we adopted this intra the government's interest, the anti-distortion interest, even media corporations couldn't take positions. Newspapers, television stations, uh, internet companies couldn't take positions supporting or opposing political candidates. And Justice Kennedy basically said this is not a valid government interest to level the playing field not only not compelling, it's not even a valid government interest. And then the second one, the government says, well, we need to have this restriction on um, corporate and union funding of commercials and so on in order to avoid corruption or the appearance of corruption. And the court said that's a valid government interest. You certainly don't want a situation where there is what the court calls quid pro quo corruption, a kind of a understanding, whether it's explicit or not, that a corporation will spend $5 million supporting a candidate and the candidate will, as a quid pro quo, return the favor to the corporation by supporting legislation favoring that corporation's interest. That, avoiding actual corruption, buying the vote, or the appearance of corruption where, having received a substantial uh, su support by a corporation, the legislator then votes on some piece of legislation. Well, it looks like it would be hard to prove, but it looks like it might be corrupt. Yeah. So, Yeah, this law exempted media corporations. So um, newspapers could, they always have endorsed candidates. They still can. I know it's a lot, okay? Yeah, it was FCC, FCC's lawyers, it was the assistant solicitor general arguing for the government in the first case who was asked, does this apply to a book? And he said, yeah. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to, and, and as you read in the Tubman piece, um, Kagan backed off that in the second argument and said, no, this law doesn't apply to books. But the cat was out of the bag already by then. Nicole? No, the amounts were not limited. It's that they couldn't do an electioneering communication, what the law called it, during a certain 30 or 60-day period before an election. They could do before that. Citizens United would have had no restriction on putting out its film, getting it on video demand, buying television time to put it on, uh, if they do it outside that window. It was a fairly narrow restriction. Then on the uh, corruption rationale, um, the court said,